Welcome everybody to uh, our January 25th uh, Human Services Committee hearing where we're going to actually do um, um, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I'll let you know I'm, I'm in the middle of uh, the energy and environment energy bill over in the next room. So if you see me get up and leave, please don't know that's not because of you that I just, I just got to get up and go vote and I'll come back. And at that case, then Senator Fate will, will take over. But what we're going to do, uh, members, is, as you know, there was an 800-page document that should have showed up on your inboxes in the last couple of days um, that have to deal with the governor's budget. And we specifically wanted the commissioner, Jody Harpstead, Elise Bailey, Christy Grom, and Matt Burdick to come in and um, kind of go through what that means for our, our jurisdictions and what we're doing and just how you're doing that, Commissioner, and just kind of have that 20,000 foot level down. And then, you know, perhaps members, we might have some questions regarding assumptions and, and who better to have having discussion of calculated assumptions than Elise Bailey, because that's what she does. So, um, and, and uh, I look forward to that conversation and I hope it sparks some, you know, good, good, good conversation like we have in the past. So. Uh, with that, members, am I missing anything? Anything else you want to add to our agenda that's not there? Um, the other, uh, let me add one more thing, and I'm sorry. Um, housing, I think, is there, are we, Senate, um, health, are we doing a housing, is there a deaf and hearty hearing on, on the agenda too as well today, Kevin? Okay, no. I, I see that wrong. My apologies, Commissioner. Um, I just, you know, having a conversation on reliability and nuclear energy has got me thinking someplace else. But no, we are just going to go through the governor's budget walkthrough with our fine, esteemed uh, members that are here with us the Miss Bailey, Miss Grom, Commissioner um, Harbstead, and Mr. Burdick. So, with that, Commissioner, the, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Hoffman. We're delighted to show you the 2425 budget recommendations from the governor's office. Uh, to start with, the Department of Human Services, working with many others, helps people achieve their, uh, helps people meet their basic needs so they can live in dignity and achieve their highest potential. So how's that for clearing out the room and bringing in human services? I love that. And, and Commissioner, are, are you, do you want folks, if they have clarifications or they want to just have engaging conversation with you, to just go ahead and sure. do it as you're doing it? All right, Absolutely. members, you good with that? Okay, our, thank our, you. Our presentation's also kind of divided into... Uh, different portions, so after each one might be the best time to stop and get questions. Our package is, a cent is centered around both the people we serve, whom you can see down the left side of this slide, and also improving the health and human services overall system. We've been working very hard over the last several years to spend much more time and intention with our counties and tribes especially as we put together a really complete health and human services system across the state. Our budget package pillars include making Minnesota the best place for all children, including black, brown, and indigenous children to grow up, while remaining one of the top five states in the nation for older adults and people with disabilities to live in. Transforming the health and human services system so that it simply works better for people. Taking a stand along with our colleagues in the Interagency Council on Homelessness for racial justice, gender justice, housing justice, and health justice. And finally, increasing our operational effectiveness and facilitating the co-creation of solutions with partners. Here's a summary of our total budget package. You can see uh, the children and families investment of 1.6, almost $7 billion. The long-term care and workforce package of $1.3 billion, which doesn't include uh, what is also in the forecast for that sector. Um, the next three, approximately uh, even investments of $300 million in access to health care, housing and homelessness, and behavioral health. Our own direct care and treatment services for uh, $232-some million. Um, service delivery transformation, which we're eager to tell you about. And then our agency effectiveness that we've been working on for several years if not forever, of $161 million for a grand total of $4.6 billion with 103 different proposals. 
looked at by fund, you can see that uh, one point uh, or two point three to <laughs> three million. Let's just say three billion <laughs> comes out of the general fund. Uh, one and a half billion out of the healthcare access fund, and then uh, smaller amounts out of the federal fund, TANF, opiate epidemic response, paid family medical leave, and the state government special revenue fund. In terms of uh, jurisdiction of this committee then, uh, you can see that we've got $2.8 billion in proposals to discuss. And again, we're going over these various boxes today, so you'll get an idea of what we're talking about in each of these areas. So first of all, talking about restructuring our work. Why don't you go ahead? Um, first of all, I just want you to know that the governor, lieutenant governor, and I have been discussing the possibility of, since I joined the administration, of whether we, there should, is a better way to structure the Department of Human Services. We are indeed a big agency, a challenge for anyone to lead. And anything smaller than what we have today would allow future governors to hire future commissioners who can manage the work. And so as we look at direct care and treatment, <clears throat> we have found this is the clearest, cleanest split of DHS. On the one hand, we have our $500 million, 5,000 employee healthcare system. You can think of it as about the size of the center care system in central Minnesota. And on the other hand, our $22.5 billion, 2,500 employee, policy formation, funding, and regulation system. DCT already has legal compliance and finance functions, so it's a pretty clean split, and it has been suggested several times in recent years with bills to do it introduced by both the House and Senate authors over the past several years. Uh, just back up once for a second. You can see down at the bottom, the investment in the split is not very expensive. Uh, because as we said, DCT has almost all of the functions it needs. We will have to divide up our HR department, for example. But um, otherwise, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty clean proposal. Um, I've also been uh, known since I came to the administration that the governor and lieutenant governor were wondering if they ever might be able to create a children and families agency to match their top priority of Minnesota as the top state in the nation for children to grow up. 22 other states have done this as well. COVID intervened in that possibility, but when they earned a second term, it was time to make both of these proposals uh, a reality. And this is also a very strong decision, borrowing on um, different parts of various uh, agencies across state government, bringing together holistic supports for families to ensure every child has a safe place to call home, never goes hungry, has the resources and supports to succeed in and out of the classroom, centering children, youth, and families, a two-year process that we will go through to move core support divisions together in 2024. And the governor's revised budget will include further planning uh, that you'll get to see when that comes out. Elise, off to you. Yes. I'm wondering if I have the wrong deck up. <laughs> Do I? Okay. Sorry. You can say about DCT first. Yes, yes. Uh, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner Harpstead, could you talk a little bit about you know the the carve out of the direct care and treatment agency? Are there other states that have followed this model and have found success, or could you tell me what your work and research into this topic has shown you? Commissioner Harpstead. Thank you, Chair Hoffman and Senator Rasmussen. Um, I, when I, w I became commissioner, I was handed a notebook of the 10 other times that it's been considered to change D DHS in some way. Um, most of them around the difference between health and human services has been the, most of the discussion and the studies that have been done over the years. Um, when it comes to direct care and treatment, there are some states that have that uh, combined with behavioral health. 
There are states that have it the way we have it. I've, I've also learned looking around at the various studies and getting reports from people who are looking at them more, more directly that if you've seen one state, you've seen one state. <laughs> and um, the way the different states come together in terms of health and human services is often a function of something that happens in a given year uh, that changes something and causes a restructure. Um, governors who come in uh, with a specific interest like the Children and Families Agency that causes that. Um, states are able to operate these systems in a variety of different structures. So, you know, we can't really say that 40 of the 50 states have it this way and we're an outlier because every single one is structured differently. We heard conversations last year as we were discussing whether to have a separate behavioral health agency, that some states had a separate behavioral health agency. When you go to look at their organization chart, you find their behavioral health agency reporting to the Commissioner of Health and Human Services. So, you know, it's, uh, these are all complex systems, uh, but there's no one particular given uh, approach that, that stands out as the way to go. Um, having managed the Department of Human Services for the last three years, um, I have looked at this often and thought that the cleanest split would be DCT uh, from DHS, as, I, as I've said, because of the separate missions. You've got a healthcare system you have to run every day. We watched that happen throughout the COVID pandemic with the specific needs that that group had. Um, they, they never went remote. They went into, the, into work every single day. Uh, taking care of people 24-7, very, very different from the policy development that we do in our central office in St. Paul. So uh, that has always seemed to me to be the, the cleanest way to think about something separate. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate that. And would the, the head of this new DCT agency, would they report directly to the governor or would they report to the commissioner of DHS? Commissioner. Um, to, the, to the governor, um, well, not to the not to the Department of Human Services, but the details of the governance will be coming in the revised budget. Senator, thank you for bringing that up. So, the, the commissioner to, to Senator Rasmussen's points, do you? Um, I would assume you have some timelines you're thinking, or you, you'll share with the people that you're going to need some statutory authority somewhere along yep. the line. But it's like, let's hurry up and do it now, right? It's it's you're. Yeah, so the timing for the looking at, excuse me, the DCT uh, is about the same as the timing for the Children and Families Agency that it would go into effect in July of 2024, giving us 18 months to talk about it, design it, think about it, bring it to you twice. So that's good to know. So it's like thoughtful. So it'll, it'll have opportunities to come in front of us so we can take a look at you know, a lot of people, the question in the middle of the room is, didn't we try this once, children, families, and learning or something was, you know, it's like, but what's going to be different about yeah. that, I think, is your, your statement. No, we're going to look at the truly integration yeah. of how these services go. So I'll be looking forward to those conversations. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Rasmussen, for bringing that. Ms. Bailey. Well, it's still the commissioner's turn, so sorry about the tech uh, issues. I've got the right deck up now. Thank you, so. uh, commissioner. As I was saying. <laughs> you did a great job, though. <laughs> DCT serves 12,000 patients each year with highly specialized care. Uh, the only behavioral health system of its kind, size, and scope in Minnesota um, with uh, co patients with complex needs who are civilly committed. We often say that DCT serves people that no one else can or will serve in the state of Minnesota. And as any health system, over 85% of their operating expenditures are personnel costs. The DCT operating adjustment, which we talk to you about every year, provides an operating increase to cover the full cost of care for patients and clients in our system. It increases the base appropriation by about 9.7% for the biennium. We have a workforce shortage like everyone else in Minnesota, and this increase is necessary to avoid cuts in services and to maintain a safe staff-to-client ratio. And then in terms of some of our program enhancements, um, DCT has looked at other ways to sustain services and support people once they leave our facilities or to help uh, people avoid institutional care. 
Uh, this initiative invests in the ongoing stability and safety of provisionally discharged patients who've left our services and clients living in the community and to provide support to avoid returns to DCT facilities. It also maintains inpatient substance use addiction treatment services for people civilly committed as chemically dependent. And so um, these uh, outcomes will be reached by expanding outpatient clinical services not available in the community that will address the outpatient needs for people who've been in DCT facilities. So, Commissioner, it, it, you're just gonna do that with the flat funding that you have right now, so this is internal movement of pieces, correct? Mm -hmm. Do you have more to say? Um, yes, Chair Hoffman, uh, we have a current and ongoing appropriation um, for another part of uh, direct care and treatment through our community-based MSOCs program, and we're proposing to kind of repurpose that for the CARES program, because um, at this point in time, um, CARES is supposed to be operated via revenue, um, but we, in, in a, a lot of the cases, um, we're unable to bill for the services because um, if folks um, don't want to receive treatment, uh, we can't bill for, for that time that they're there. Um, and so we have, we, we're unable to kind of sustain the level of services we're providing in that program. So we're proposing in our proposal to repurpose a different appropriation that we get through the MSOX program um, for this program. Thank you, Ms. Bailey, for clarifying that. Commissioner? Off to you. Yes, okay, for the record, at least Bailey, budget director, and I'm gonna go over uh, the next several slides. Um, this, uh, we, we have several proposals in our package around service delivery transformation, where we're really trying to shore up um, the infrastructure within the department um, on our systems and how we really deliver services to people. And one major component of the service delivery transformation package is our direct care and treatment electronic health record. Um, this is a similar proposal that we had last year, um, but what it will do, it, it would finally um, implement a comprehensive, integrated, and interoperable um, EHR system, the uh, electronic health record system throughout our direct care and treatment um, services. And of course, this will really benefit people that we serve to really facilitate continuity of care uh, across different providers um, throughout the state. Um, and then also a uh, big note is it puts us finally into compliance with state and federal re regulations that require us to do that. Right now we have piles and piles of paper that we you know, manage records for the, the people that we serve and this will be a, a big benefit to, to the people we serve. Senator Asmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A uh, question for Ms. Bailey. So uh, currently DCT does not have a EHR? Ms. Bailey. Um, Chair Hoffman, Senator Rasmussen, we have been working on developing an EHR, but currently we do not have a fully functioning one at this time. Senator Rasmussen. And um, follow up, Ms. Bailey, would, would this be uh, you know, bringing an outside vendor that would be providing the EHR, or is this something that's been developed internally? Ms. Bailey. Uh, Chair Hoffman, I'd like to maybe call up a friend. I think, I'm thinking Senator Rasmussen, you're, you're starting to theme out about things I think that you're interested in, uh, you know, so this has been, this is good. And, and Mr. Chair, if we need to keep things moving, I can always follow up with the agency. You're fine. We're, yeah, I think we're okay because I, I, I wanted to limit it to just, you know, these guys really focusing on, you know, what the governor is, is bringing forward and then, you know, uh, the, that'll focus on the work that we need to be doing and somewhere along the line we'll come to some kind of... Compromise. So, with that, uh, please, I don't, for the record, who you are and and uh, and uh, answer the good senator's question, I suppose. Huh? Good afternoon. Uh, for the record, I'm Dan Storkamp, Director of Operation Services for Direct Care and Treatment. And uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Rasmussen, uh, we currently are working with NetSmart, which is a national organization or a national uh, company that does behavioral health electronic records, which mm. we're really focusing in on. But it is in joint uh, development with Minute and our DCT direction on what we're looking for. So we've got the outside vendor with their system that we uh, are enhancing to uh, get rid of the paper. Senator Rasmussen. All right, uh, Commissioner. 
Uh, thank you, and, and just to put an exclamation point on your question, <laughs> um, yes, DCT is, the, is about the only health system in Minnesota without an electronic health record in 2023. There may be an, an occasional individual hospital that doesn't have one, but uh, we're the only real system that doesn't. And uh, it's been in budget proposals over the years and not gotten over the bridge. And this is the kind of infrastructure we've been talking about that we really need to get us to the 21st century and uh, make it easier to not just run DCT, but to make patient information available when people transfer to other systems or come in from other systems and uh, get their own data out of our system. So very important that we finally uh, get to this. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Asmussen, for that. Thank you, Commissioner. Miss Bailey, did I get that right? You did. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'm going to go over a few other proposals we have in our category that we have titled agency effectiveness, of course, trying to make our work work better um, for the people served in our partners. Um, so slide 16, um, we have a proposal on changing the fees um, that we charge for our background studies. And this really relates to um, the fees that the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, BCA, charges us um, to conduct those background studies. And that has changed from $42 per study to $44 per study. And so this proposal um, aligns the fees that we charge then um, to, to those um, increased costs. It also enables us to, uh, um, ongoing to be able to change the fees that we charge according to changes that, that in these fees over time. Um, and it also allocates general fund dollars um, to cover the cost of studies conduct conducted for tribal organizations for adoption and child foster care. Um, for background, we have over 70 provider types with um, 35,000 active providers that we do background studies for. Um, and annually, it, um, the amount of background studies that we have conducted has increased 45% since 2018. Um, so that kind of warrants these two changes on this page. One, the, the background fee uh, change that I went over, and then the next one is um, getting a general fund appropriation to increase um, our operational costs in the background studies area. Um, as I said, you know, the, the number of background studies has increased by 45% um, in recent years, and this is a really critical service that we provide um, that, that um, if given the resources, we, were, we would be able to more quickly um, process them and kind of uh, meet the demands of the market in the workforce. So maybe the commissioner can kind of talk about, that's always been the, there's a lot of organizations, not a lot, I better, you know, there's, Organizations that have said that because of that backlog of background studies and in, in the backlog that by the time they're able to offer somebody a position, it's too late, especially in today's market where, I don't know, you could go work at McDonald's in Burnsville and get paid 21 bucks an hour flipping burgers. But, you know, if we want to work as a, you know, ESL or something or whatever in a day program, you're, you know, you're making 15 bucks an hour if you're lucky. So... What, what, what's the, do you see this as a way to close that gap or, you know, can you talk about your hot spots, maybe commissioner and what you're doing to help address that or what's the best way to be able, if somebody's feeling like they're stuck in the system, who's the best contact, how's the best way to get that so that they can have a spotlight on them? Thoughts? Uh, yes, Chair Hoffman, just want to mention that um, before COVID, uh, most of our background checks cleared in 24 to 48 hours, 85% uh, of them, uh, 15 uh, flag something in that first check and need to be double checked further, usually with other states to see if other states have any information about the person that we're doing the background check for. Uh, now that we are where we are, having virtually caught up with that um, backlog of folks from, from the emergency background checks during COVID, we're back to exactly the same numbers, 85% clear in 24 to 48 hours, 15% require additional check. I will say that with the workforce shortage we have coming out of the pandemic years, that 15% with the extra weight is particularly painful, more than it was before. <laughs> and so that is a problem and that, we're, that people are feeling. Um, but our system works about the same way that it did before. And so um, 
appreciate that that's a, a real challenge when something like that uh, keeps keeps things slowed down. The only thing I could suggest as a potential solution is for us to take a look at the areas that were required to do background checks that require the extra checking and ask ourselves whether a little subtraction might be in order there in terms of keeping the whole system moving faster because of the workforce shortage. Thank you, and it, 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 um, to hear you say that because there's like, you hear of that anecdotally, and we don't legislate by anecdotes. But you know, you hear the story of I'm, I'm already clear. I'm already cleared by the BCA to work in this field, but now I'm going to go over here, and they're going to have to get recleared again. And you know, to, to hear you say we, you know, take another look at that. That's something you could do without legislative authority, correct? Uh, I'm not sure. Some things we could, some things we couldn't. We've also had a background study task force that will be coming out with their report, and we can see what, what they have found as well. Do you know when that report's going to be I am not due? Sure. Do you know, yeah, Jody, know. or Commissioner? Sometime in the next? Soon. Soon. <laughs> You'll be sharing it with us, I would assume. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. Members, any questions? Go ahead, Ms. Bailey, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this next slide goes over some resources and proposals around our licensing division. Um, Op 76, Critical Resources for Licensing. This proposal um, adds more staffing to the department so that we can conduct our licensing and maltreatment reviews in a more timely manner as well. Um, this is a kind of a repeat from last year, um, and it's really critical, particularly in today's age, um, uh, to respond effectively to workforce challenges and ensure that we're able to process initial um, licensing applications as well as um, you know, going out and on time to do our, our regular ongoing renewing um, licensing at activities amidst the workforce shortage. So in this case, I'm gonna ask for Senator Utke, the, that would, on the folks that are providing services under 245D, this would be a direct positive impact to get that from waiting instead you know the statute is 60 days but you got folks that are 9 12 even 18 months just because of some other stuff that this would directly impact that correct chair hoffman yes absolutely all right thank you Op 78 is our home and community-based services corporate licensing fee change. We're proposing to increase the licensing fees for non-individuals, so for corporate entities applying for a home and community-based service license, to align that fee with the non-individual license application fee um, that is charged by the Minnesota Department of Health um, in their comprehensive home care license. Um, and then the last item on this slide is streamlining behavioral health regulation. This is the next uh, phase in um, what is termed the USS um, pro, uh, change, the Universal Services and Standards for Mental Health Services. And what this would do is begin the creation of a single comprehensive licensing structure for mental health service programs, um, moving some um, regulation that occurs in the Behavioral Health Division over to our um, Office of Inspector General area and kind of streamlining it into a single comprehensive structure. And I'm going to dive next into workforce and long-term care proposals. So we've done a lot of work in the department over the last year, really kind of grappling with, of course, as you all did last session, about the workforce challenges that this industry ha is experiencing. And it's absolutely historic over, um, as of the end of last year, over 52,000 vacancies um, in the social uh, service industry. Um, and that's higher than it has at least been in the last 20 years um, by far. And so we've, you know, it's a known fact that, that that's a challenge, but we've done a lot of work on prioritizing, okay, where does the investment really need um, to be prioritized? And so what you'll see in our package is that we've prioritized investments where we have found that the average direct care staff wage is the lowest, and where current law doesn't already provide automatic um, increases to those services or to um, the workers. And we also want to ensure that those particular services um, can compete not only with other industries, as you said, Burger King and, and the other um, 
shops down the street, but also with other service providers that they're competing for workers with. Um, they're all kind of competing for the same um, group of people to, to provide the services um, in the same industry. And so we've done a lot of work looking at what the wages are um, and what kind of um, solutions we can deploy um, to raise those up. We're also, our package also prioritizes supports to assist people to remain in their home and to remain in their own communities um, because you know, a failure in that level of our service, service, social service infrastructure um, could have even more drastic workforce impacts um, down the line. Um, we also have a priority on increasing the wages and access to competitive employment for people with disabilities themselves. So you'll see a big package in, um, big proposal in our package uh, around that. Um, and then beyond increasing rates, um, we also have, have thought a lot about how do we have more innovative approaches um, and kind of uh, bringing forward a multifaceted approach to the workforce shortage because it will take a village, of course, um, to combat it. So without further ado, our first uh, workforce proposal that we are proposing is to increase the rates for home care workers uh, through the Community First Services and Supports, or the PCA program. Um, this proposal increases those um, services so that people can remain in their homes, uh, remain employed, and engage in community life. What's innovative about this proposal is that we're proposing to have a tiered rate structure that aligns with how much experience um, the PCA or CFSS worker has worked in the field um, to try to um, not only attract new workers to the workforce, but also retain them. Um, this proposal also increases the consumer-directed community supports budgets, um, which is an innovative program, um, particularly in a workforce shortage, where people can have informal supports um, serving them in their home and communities, rather than relying on um, what's, what's, of course, a very tight labor market. Our next proposal is a package around older adult long-term care services. Um, this proposal increases the service rates um, that are provided under the Elderly Waiver, or EW, Alternative Care AC and Essential Community Supports ECS programs to address the unprecedented workforce shortage in that area. Um, these rates will increase by an average of 9.8% effective January 1st, 2024. And then we would also deploy an inflationary adjustment in this area. So by uh, 2026, that uh, it would increase 11%. This proposal also increases the monthly budgets, again, for people um, using the CDCS program. Right now, those budgets are set at a lower amount than if the person had a budget under the traditional um, elderly waiver AC or ECS program. And so what this would do uh, is uh, have parity um, for the budgets, whether you choose to be on CDCS or you choose traditional level services, um, your budget would be the same. The next slide kind of goes over some of those innovative uh, grant workforce programs I was speaking about earlier. Um, this proposal funds two permanent grant programs to address uh, the workforce shortage with really a dedicated focus on expanding both the depth and diversity of the workforce and improving um, recruitment and retention. So one uh, grant program in this proposal is the Provider Capacity Grants for Rural and Underserved Communities. This was a new grant program that we passed in the 21 session, um, but it was funded through the HCBS FMAP dollars um, that were, of course, temporary. So what this proposal does is put it into the base, um, so it's an ongoing grant program. Um, the goal of this uh, grant program is to um, assist providers who are interested in serving um, in the HCBS sector in rural or underserved communities, so assisting them in startup um, and all sorts of uh, um, support in, in starting to be a provider, but also um, support to maybe current providers who want to expand uh, to different services or different areas of the state. Um, the second piece of this pr proposal is adding a new grant program really focused on immigrants, refugees, and new Americans. Um, who are interested in joining the long-term care workforce. So this, this grant program 
would um, provide funds to community-based organizations who would assist people with recruiting, uh, matching them with employers, and ongoing supports and helping them retain um, employment in the long-term care sector. So Ms. Bailey, do you know, or Commissioner, that is, <clears throat> how, how is DEED interacting in that line with you guys financially? Uh, Chair Hoffman, uh, financially DEED is not um, connected to this proposal, but we have been working a lot with DEED on this package um, in general, um, mm -hmm. and we can, we can connect more with them on this proposal ongoing. It just seems odd that, you know, you, you look at, you know, the agency's buckets, right? And, and, I mean, why would my brain automatically go? You're trying to get help, and, and I'm going to give a couple of, there's a couple of nursing homes that I know that actually worked through DEED to get folks from other countries to come here on some work thing. Um, don't know what the work thing is, because I don't, but if you want to ask me about Public Law 99-457, I'll go all day on that one. But in this case, there is that, they, they were working with them on doing that to guess what, have those folks working in the you know, nursing home facility, and it just, I went to that saying, okay, we have an economic situation, right? And and how are they how are they being partners in that? And it's just so I it wasn't meant to be a, you know, gotcha kind of thing, but rather, you know, to me it just makes sense, doesn't it, that if it's DHS related and it's economic, you know, sustainability, you know, where are they in that? And and you I think he answered it by saying, Yeah, they are in conversations, but where's the purposeful planning piece from them? on that is, I guess, where my challenges or question. I don't know, does that make sense? Yes, Chair Hoffman, we can follow up on that. I think that's a good, that's a good suggestion. Um, the next slide, 23. Um, this is our Vulnerable Act redesign pro, uh, proposal. So um, we're finding that with our uh, vulnerable adults, the MARC system, um, that a large percentage of vulnerable adult reports that come into our system aren't actually followed up on. And um, so we've been working with community on this, on how do we redesign the system to really work effectively across the state. Um, so this proposal addresses disparities in the adult protection services um, for people with disabilities and older adults who live in their own home. And it does a few things. First, it, it includes the first ever state funding for tribal nations. Um, to assist them in providing culturally appropriate protective services for, vul for vulnerable adult members in their communities. Currently, there is no funded funding provided to tribal nations um, through, through the adult protection services that we um, oversee um, because they don't get reports through the MARC system. And so this um, proposal would provide that funding. Um, secondly, we would uh, provide much more funding to counties um, to support um, their response to the adult protection investigation and services. So once they receive um, these reports, this funding would enable them to have more capacity to follow up on those reports. Um, one big thing is a minimum allocation will be made for each county so that they, each county will at, at least have a sufficient base level um, of money to um, enable them to have adult protective service programs. Um, lastly, this proposal um, improves our MARC system, so the, the web-based reporting system um, that we have. We are proposing to revamp that um, to a more web-based, user-friendly, intuitive um, system that works better for, for all users. This next slide goes over our critical access nursing facilities proposal. So this proposal revamps a, a current nurse, uh, critical access nursing facility program that we, we have but cannot utilize at this point in time due to the implementation of the value-based reimbursement or VBR. Um, so this would revamp that uh, program and add funding um, to address the financial viability for rural nursing homes at risk of closure. Um, we're estimating that this funding would assist about 15 rural nursing facilities and 500 residents of rural communities annually, um, and it would give those facilities increased funding for a temporary um, period of time.
This next slide goes over one new idea that um, we're really excited about, uh, the creation of a tribal elder office at DHS um, with the intent to really promote true government to government um, relationship um, with the, the 11 federally recognized tribal nations in the state. Um, so there's a few things that we really want this tribal elder office to do, um, to have the dedicated resources for us to enable to provide technical expertise um, to directly access and maximize the use of federal funds. So there's specific federal funds that could be available to tribes that we don't currently tap into, um, and this proposal would enable us to assist in doing that. Um, we're also hoping to establish a long-term care services and supports, or LSSS, work group um, with tribal nations, and to build capacity in tribes to, to, for them to provide long-term services and supports to their members. Commissioner, how do you see that interacting? We, we created the um, Indian Tribal Ombudsman's Office last year, correct, out of this committee. Um, Senator Abler, I wish he was here to, how do you see that Tribal Elder Office um, working in, in conjunction with that or not, this, this would be a DHS position versus an ombudsman's position, correct? Uh, Chair Hoffman, yes, it, it would. We already have our DHS Office of Indian Policy, which does have true government-to-government -government relationships and, and respecting the sovereign status of our tribal nations. Um, it, we interact with them more right now in their healthcare systems and their children's services, and so this would be a focus on their elders and the services for older adults and people with disabilities. So it, it just extends the number of services we would work with our tribal nations on, which we already do very actively every year. Interesting, because it's also the, when you look at the, you know, our long-term care ombudsman, but this is some, this is within, the, I just need to wrap, yeah. I need to wrap my head around the lining up of all these different responsibilities, and, and, and I think I get it now. I, mm -hmm. I had to answer that old question, so thank you, mm -hmm. Ms. Bailey. Thank you. Uh, we're also proposing to make a few changes to um, our MA, or Medicaid system, and, and, and improving the programs uh, for people with disabilities. Um, so help HC67 is improving the MA experience for people with disabilities, and this is really centered around um, the SMERT determinations or the state medical review team. So the state medical review team uh, performs the disability determinations that really becomes the basis of eligibility for MA. Um, SMERT completes these determinations according to criteria defined by the Social Security Administration. And counties submit referrals to SMERT when a so, uh, di disability determination is necessary for eligibility. Um, and we've seen in recent years just a really big um, increase in the number of SMERT determinations requested um, and needed to be done at the department. And so what this proposal would do is uh, provide resources at DHS to respond to that demand. Um, for example, in state fiscal year 21, the average time from the receipt of us receiving a referral to the dis disability decision was 88 days. Um, and so this proposal would really benefit people um, so that that, that time, time amount is much shorter and that they have access to services that they need in a, in a faster fashion. Um, this would also um, provide upgrades to our MAXIS system or give us resources to upgrade the MAXIS system, which is where um, all of our eligibility for people with disabilities and older adults occurs. And then lastly, uh, the MAEPD program improvements and conforming changes. This proposal, um, this proposal improves the MAEPD program. So right now, um, there's a lot of we how we bill uh, the MAEPD program. Let me back up. Sorry, the MAEPD program is the Medicaid program for employed persons with disabilities. And um, they have a premium that we bill out in one system called our, our SWIFT system. Um, and everything else occurs in different systems. 
um, and there cre it creates a lot of kind of challenges uh, of understanding it, it with throughout the program. And so what this proposal would do would, would be to shift that over to our um, MMIS system. It would also make some changes to conform with federal law around our MEPD program. So does that, I'm looking at you, Christy Grom, the, the, that's great. It, it clarifies that, it solidifies that, it makes it easier, but there's still that issue of a, you know, a, a cap on MAEPD, and there's so many moving pictures within that, which is we want people with disabilities to work, right? We want them to work, and they want to work full time, but yet if they do, then there's all these restrictions that are other system stuff that just doesn't allow the system to allow somebody to fully actualize that. Is that what we've always talked about under MAPD? Is that factored in this in in, in the the investment here? That's nine point three and six point one million. Does that factor that, or is that just purely on the MMIS stuff? Uh, Senator Huffman, this does not change what a person would be okay. um, required to pay. All right, so members, that's just, that's okay. This is good because now it's like, you know, we want to effectuate some change in MAEPD. It's outside of the scope of this conversation. So right. thank you. I appreciate that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over at this point to Ms. Grom. Ms. Grom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, Christy Grom with the Department of Human Services. Um, so I'm going to walk through the next six or so slides, I think, as part of the workforce solutions um, before jumping into behavioral health. Um, so the first slide up here is our database rates for residential and own, own home services. Um, so this is a pretty significant um, investment, around $81 million in the next biennium, um, and $40 million, I think, in the out years. Um, and for folks that might not know, the disability waiver rate system um, was revamped, I think, around 2014. So prior to that, we had um, county negotiated rates with providers. Um, and since then, it's been revamped and rebuilt. It's a pretty sophisticated rate methodology um, and a pretty complex one. But it's essentially based off of um, people's uh, support needs as well as a variety of um, data factors that, that factor into how much it costs to provide a service. Um, so this proposal um, is updating some of the factors within the rate methodology um, to make sure that we're, we're getting money sooner to providers. So right now we have um, biennial rate increases for the Bureau of Labor Statistics component um, rate, uh, rate components and also for the consumer price in index components. Um, and the next rate increase is going to be, I think, in law right now, November of 2024. And so this proposal would bump up that, um, that inflationary update that happens automatically in law to January of 2024, um, and then continue to rebase every two years thereafter. So we we're trying to get money into the hands of providers who are providing these really critical services, no matter if you're providing services in a person's own home or um, in a residential setting or a day setting, um, providers would, would benefit from this. So, Ms. Grom, could you, on the, the disability waiver, waiver rates structure, DWRS that you talked about, yes, January 1 of 2014, CMS is gonna say, you have to, I remember that, it just seems like yesterday when we had this conversation and mm -hmm. all the changes you put in place. A Couple of things. Why not move that, that rate up from January 2024 to January 2023? What, what was the reason behind going to 24 instead of 23 on that, that particularly point? Um, Mr. Chair, I'm not quite sure if we would be able to implement by 2023. And so I think that that was the barrier there. We're certainly open to ongoing conversations with you know, the legislature and I know stakeholders are bringing forward some ideas around um, how, how to, you know, um, time these rate increases and also what data to use. So we'll be interested to be a part of those conversations ongoing. So in that in that piece on that, which is I, I assume that it would to implement it, is that because it's the the federal you have to do the federal get permission from CMS implementation or implementation internally? What was the what was the barrier there? Help me understand that. Mr. Chair, it's, um, it's my understanding that it, it could be a CMS issue. I think we have an ability right now under the public health emergency to get 
approvals a little bit more quickly than, yep. than we uh, normally would. But I think that this was largely a systems issue, that it was just not feasible. It would require um, an extensive amount of people to be hired and to, to process the information needed to, to um, make that rate increase occur. And those are people time. internally, right? right. Correct. Because, okay. I mean, it's as we're looking at that, that piece of the home and community-based services providers, right, they're the ones going, well, we can't compete. That's where the storyline of $14.72 versus $21 at... And it was a McDonald's in Burnsville. Get it's all right. Burger King, McDonald's. How many times did I mess up going back and forth? But under that proposal, there's an inflationary question. Um, are you using any one-time money in that piece? It, and this is probably an Elise Bailey question because it's a financial one. Because I just am trying. I'm trying to wrap my head around this. Here's this need this impact and we're going to move it out we have the inflationary piece in there and i think and i did chicken scratch for me because the other question i had on that was we're using the bureau of labor statistics which is data that's may of the previous year so we're really in looking at like two-year-old data have we offset any of that stuff in this conversation because i'm ultimately going to say is there enough money in this bucket to, to fix the issue that we see is in front of us? So does that see my series of questionings there? Uh, Chair Hoffman, I assume you're asking about um, the inflationary adjustments just because the, the, the money in the first biennium is more than the money in the second biennium. Um, that is because under current law, we're already assuming inflationary adjustments in the forecast. Um, and so in that tails piece, the 26-27, we're already assuming the full cost of the next inflationary adjustment, but at a later time period. So basically we're taking costs that would have occurred later and they occur earlier. So that's why it's kind of front loaded at that point in time. Your second question, um, I, I'm under the understanding that um, this proposal is just moving the dates it doesn't change the look back period. It doesn't. So um, we could, but he's making those, those change dates, is that, do you need our authority to change those dates? Is that something that is worthwhile of a conversation about why those dates specifically? Yes, Mr. Okay. Chair, those are in law um, and we certainly could grab data at an earlier date. Uh, operationally we could if the law said a different date. Yeah, I just I'm I'm, I'm really just looking at that 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 system and saying you know how can we get them because everybody's you know help us out urgency right there's this there's an urgent cry out there for a whole bunch of those caregiving positions right and um, how how does that look like what does that look like and as I looked at the dollar amount of you know the human services committee total in in fiscal year twenty four twenty five is seven hundred nineteen million four hundred twenty seven thousand dollars. I ain't gonna cut it. I mean, I just I looked at that. That's I said that to the commissioner out in the hallway. It's like we got a long way to go here, right? That's just my first look at it, right? And I guess that's where the conversation is. How did we get to that? Where did we get to that? Is there any room into that piece? So, Chair Hoffman, I think we'd we'd be happy to to work together with you on on that. God, love it. Awesome. So uh, I'm sorry. Keep going. I have I have some bureau of labor statistics stuff. We already know that it's wrapped around. We know the system is just there. I think if there's anything else, um, I'll I'll just keep going. So go Thank ahead, you, Mr. Ms. Chair. Crown. And I have to go vote in like ten minutes. So I just got notice. So if I if I leave, just know I'm not. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, so we'll move to the next uh, part of this proposal, um, oh, which is sorry. an increase or. Instituting a, a rate methodology, a database rate methodology for in intermediate care facilities for persons with developmental disabilities. Um, so these are facilities that not a lot of people are choosing to live at anymore, but there are indeed many people living there, enough people living there. They're aging in place. They have some pretty complex needs. Um, and they used to have a cost-based rate that was frozen by the legislature quite a while ago. Um, and since then, we've seen many concerns from intermediate care facilities. You probably are familiar with the kind of one-off rate increase requests um, because we have those historic rates in statute. So this proposal would um, set a rate floor to bump people up to 
a certain amount, so it would bump quite a few providers up to a particular rate floor, um, and then the rates would be rebased um, every two years. Um, so eventually we would get providers up to a same, the same statewide rate. Um, and then moving on to our next, one of our really big workforce proposals um, supporting uh, the workforce and pe for people who live in their own homes. Um, Ms. Bailey mentioned earlier that we took a data-based approach with our, with our budget this year and really looking at our labor market reporting, our provider cost reporting, um, and trying to understand where we need to target funding, knowing that um, even with a big surplus, there is just not enough money to go around for all the needs that we have. Um, and so this was one of the packages where we really honed in on some of those wages for services that are serving people in their own homes. Um, so this is a, a pretty big investment of 30 million in the first biennium and about 50, 53 in the out years. Um, and so quite a few uh, provisions to this proposal. Um, there's an increase to the positive support services. So this is a service that serves people with um, pretty complex behavioral health needs. Um, and we found uh, have some difficulty attracting the correct professionals um, to provide that service. This is also a hospital decompression strategy, um, trying to get more people access to these important um, services for, for people who might be labeled as aggressive or having complex conditions. Um, we're also updating the competitive workforce factor for our unit-based services in our, in our disability waiver rate. So um, our unit-based services are services that are provided in someone's own home, or they could be um, our employment services, for example. Um, and the competitive workforce factor is a factor that um, Ms. Bailey helped to construct uh, a few years ago that really accounts for the disparity in wages for people who need um, the same level of education and experience for this particular, um, for, for this um, direct support professional job with people who work in other professions, say mm -hmm. for example construction, who have the same um, amount of experience and education requirements. And so um, our competitive workforce factor is in need of being updated in those rates and so this proposal does that. So can I ask a question to that? I'm glad you segued into that because that's the, the competitive workforce factor, right? We're not where we need to be because of all the stuff that's in front of us. So mm -hmm. I guess what is, where does that increase need to be in order to get us to where that competitive workforce factor would be, where it, where it should be? Um, Mr. Chair, that's a great question. I wish I had the data in front of me right now. I don't know, Ms. Bailey, if you remember it, but we do, we do have a legislative report that we publish every year, and you should have that. Um, I can certainly provide that to the, the committee following this, but um, I don't believe we're proposing to fully fund the competitive workforce factor under this proposal, but we can get back to you around what the research is showing in terms of that disparity. So, it, yeah, because I find it interesting that we know that that's, that has a lot to do. Senator Abler, go ahead. I'm mid-sentence. No, you didn't interrupt because I'm going to go. I'm going to go vote here, and I'm just going to. All right. I was just reading the summary. It's three and a half percent, I think. Um, anyway, and so just trying to figure who this is for. This isn't the regular home care people. There's nothing in the budget for them. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Senator Abler. Um, when you say regular home care people, this is for direct support professionals who provide right. disability waiver services. Right. DSPs. So we talk about home care um, and Could. all that, like what the children's in their home and all that, pediatric home service, all that business is not part of this. Is that right? Um, Mr. Chair, Senator Abler, uh, this does not cover state plan services like home care and nursing that you might be referring right. to with, yeah. when you talk about PHS. Um, but this does cover things like individualized housing supports and our new employment services and supports like that who really are really critical for people um, to stay in their own homes. Senator Abel. Oh, no, that's, that's fine. I, um, we, we talked on the phone. The commissioner called me up and kind of gave me the once over on this stuff. And um, you're going to leave pretty soon so you can hear my little comment. So I, um, there's a lot of stuff in your budget. We heard a bunch of the provisions for different supports and uh, other committee. Um, and my concern is we really need to make sure what we're doing now works before we add a whole bunch of other stuff and a whole other 1,200 FTEs and you need some for licensing. And you persuaded me of that, uh, Commissioner, as well as a few other places. I don't even know we're going to find 1,200 bodies to work in, a, in this work environment. Um, but I'm really concerned about the services that we have that people rely on. And you've heard me say this 
50 times, I'm sure, and I'm not even exaggerating, but, you know, the different waiver programs, the, you know, the people trying to do their own little, you know, talking about the rates they get when they go off of a group home and how that's a problem and how people can't get home care, they can't get nurses to go out there, people are stuck in the hospital. Um, and it seems to me that's a priority I wish had a little bigger star by it in some of this. And so that's just, I'm just going to leave it at that. And you know, it's not a new conversation, and I don't know. You all work for the governor, but I don't know why the governor doesn't get it. It says in the paper, the governor this, the governor that. Okay, well, then the governor needs to understand that these programs that are on the verge of collapse need some attention, notwithstanding the incredible efforts on the part of the three of you and the crew in the corner and the people watching back in the department. Um, and so I commend you for that, but he has to get it. If he's going to take the credit or the blame, then it's, he's the chief executive. And people who cannot, there's 11, the, the nursing homes turned away 11,000 people that wanted to come. That's not a data point of success. Um, they are burning through their reserves. And so they can hopefully stay open. Uh, the, home, the people doing PCA and CFSS and all that are barely able to make means, and I understand there's barely enough money in this, in this budget to pay for the raises that I would love the SCIU workers to get. I'm a fan. So, you know, and... Uh, I'll stop pretty soon, but you, there's $17.6 billion, and we had to dip into the health care access fund by a billion or more to pay for stuff. And, like, we got to have priorities, and I'm just, I have a hard time, Mr. Chair, getting off this priority when I see it going unsatisfied while we yep. try to reach into some other networks. Well, you, I will stop, Mr. Chair. You, you don't have to stop. I hope you never stop, Senator Abel. I've known you for 20-some years, and that would just not be in your bailiwick to stop because you, people... There are folks out there, and, and the question on the table, I think, is, you know, is this proposal that the governor budget-wise has put together is going to address all what we see as needs are? And I think, you know, that was the first comment I looked at it, $719 million doesn't get us to where we, we think, you know, when we're sitting here having the discussion, it needs to be, right? And so, which you also bring up, you know, I guess one of the fiscal questions before I go vote is, the $800 million that was calculated, and maybe we'll get to that when you go through. Are you going to do PCA? You're going to talk about that later, Christy? She's going to do that. And we can come back and maybe have a conversation on that. But um, yeah, it's like, you know, are we putting enough money into where the system, and, and to your point, you like, you know, there's a lot of priorities out there. But you know what? I just, I, I guess maybe once I would just like somebody in the United States of Minnesota to say, Human services is my number one, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I, I'd say that tongue-in-cheek, but it really is. We know where you guys are in that, in that priority-wise, and so hearing what Abler's saying. So, Commissioner, I'm sorry I'm yakking, but I'm going to go vote. Go ahead. Chairman um, Hoffman and, and Senator Abler, I just want to remind you that our whole package for a long-term care workforce is a, a billion three. And that doesn't include the $800 million that's in the forecast for the VBR calculation for nursing homes. So it's over $2 billion in this sector. Mr. Senator Abler, you, I have to go. They're testing, All right. so. Well, this, the test is, how's it working? Are you going to take a recess? Or, oh, you're going to give it to Senator Quaid? Okay, make way. Anyway, so um, the test is, how's it working? We're much more data-driven department than when I first got here. Do you know what the, one of the indicators was? Happy clients. <laughs> okay, and so we moved along toward people not really doing recidivism and you know being working or whatever. There's a whole bunch of cool little things we have. But if if there's all these negative indicators that even with this budget passed the way it is, they're going to stay negative. That's, that worries me, and I'm not attempting to confront you more than that, Commissioner, but I just, there's money, and how do you spend it, and what do you get for it, and, you know, I think you have a $2 billion problem in the long-term care side alone. We had a billion dollars before we needed uh, to get this to stabilize, and that has now become $2 billion on the four-year thing, just in this niche, and then you can talk about something else. So I, I, thank you. I'm the chair now. Back to you. 
Uh, Madam Chair, that is kind of amazing. Um, so just a couple more things on this package and then we can move on to the, to the next slide. But um, um, also in this package is aligning our disability homemaker rates with those disability, or the homemaker rates in the elderly waiver um, system. Um, homemaker is a really critical disability service that helps people stay in their own homes and it's the rates have been very low. Um, counties in, in some cases have are not able to find providers so they're doing this service for, for people themselves. Um, and so this um, will align the rates um, better, increase them to what they are under EW and create some of that parity. I think that's something that's also carried in Senate File 7, so we're, we're happy to um, see the alignment there. Um, and then also I just want to mention the um, increasing the hourly limits for paid parents and spouses um, under the um, CDCS Consumer Directed Community Supports and CFSS programs. So making sure that we have um, hourly limits that make sense for um, for parents and spouses who are providing those services, increasing them a bit to accommodate um, some of the workforce pressures that families are experiencing right now. Senator right. Abler. Madam Chair, thank you for this stuff. I mean, it's, I'm not saying that there's, you know, there, there's some things that I would do different, but there's a lot of good things in here. But there's some pieces that there's no, there's the bottom falls out of, thank you. Madam Chair, Senator Abler, Abler, thank you. Um, so the next proposal that we'll talk about is our, our proposal around increasing wages um, and workforce participation for people with disabilities. So um, people with disabilities in Minnesota face some pretty significant barriers oftentimes in getting um, employed. I think almost 25% of people with disabilities in Minnesota are living in poverty. Um, which is you know, something that we're all wanting to reform from a civil rights perspective, but from a workforce perspective, it's also you know, a problem for the state. So um, this proposal is really aligning with our um, employment first laws, which were championed by um, maybe some of you, but um, um, Senator Abler and Senator Hoffman as well, um, making sure that we are um, providing access to competitive um, employment for people with disabilities. So it's a pretty um, robust package that I won't go completely through, but um, as part of this, we're building capacity through technical assistance and training, um, working with our lead agencies to make sure that they have what they need um, to be able to support people in gaining competitive integrated employment. Um, we're also looking at um, case manager um, training, making sure that they understand and that um, when thinking about biases that they might have, you know, um, implicit certainly, um, that, that they're um, prepared to be able to support people to make those transitions to competitive employment and not make assumptions about people. Um, we're looking to create a statewide um, Disability Employment Technical Assistance Center, um, making some changes around the min choices assessment to help assessors um, be prompted to, you know, just because you've assessed someone, the same person, um, once a year for the past five years doesn't mean that they might not have changed their mind around competitive employment. So we need to prompt, um, prompt our assessors to ask those, those questions. Um, part of this package is, is phasing out the use of subminimum wages in our waiver services. So this is a graduated phase out, um, out in 2028, mm -hmm. um, wrapped around by all of these investments to make sure that we're in a place where people aren't losing access to services um, and are transitioning in a, in a positive way. Um, we've also got, uh, Senator Hoffman mentioned, I think last week, um, some concerns around alignment, interagency alignment. Part of this package is an interagency alignment study with, um, with DEED and the Department of Education so that we can really take a look at all of the places where we provide employment services across our state agencies and understand where we're creating barriers, maybe um, unintentionally, and how we can make things better. And so providing some recommendations um, internally and, and perhaps to all of you to make some changes there. Can I ask two questions? Yes. Uh, the first is, did we see at all, I've heard anecdotally, but did we see um, any increase in people with disabilities employment during COVID? I know that some of the um, work from home measures and some of the advances that we had in technology, assisted technology helped. And did we see any like actual increase in people with disabilities being employed during the pandemic? Um, Madam Chair, that's a good question. Um, the last time, I, I should look at the, we have employment dashboards at the department where we track um, people on our waiver programs um, and kind of use a proxy measure of $600, $600 a month of 
people considering that people living in in poverty um, and probably getting like subminimum wages and obviously not competitive um, employment. Um, and the last time I looked in 2021, there was actually a decrease mm -hmm. in people getting access to competitive employment. Um, and I will say that Minnesota is, if not the the worst, um, very high up there in terms of dependence on subminimum wage in the nation. So. Um, I can take a look at the data and get back to you with more specifics about the most recent fiscal year to see where we're at. Thank you. And my, my second question was about the subminimum wage. I mean, I loathe it. And I, um, the phase out in 2028, was that part of the recommendation from the task force? Or is that something the governor was like, let's just get it done? Madam Chair, thank you for, um, for bringing that up. Yes, yeah, so all of the proposals in the provisions in this proposal are recommendations from the, the task force to phase out the use of subminimum wage or to, to plan for it. Um, I think that the, the task force report is due out in mid-February, and I believe that their date is a little bit sooner than ours, so we, we chose 2028. I think um, we had had some advice fr from um, providers and legislators that maybe five years was the amount of time that people thought it would, it would take to get everyone transitioned and, and their business models and their contracts amended, um, but we are definitely open to conversations if people would like to do it sooner. Thank you. I'm just gonna look at anybody else have questions. Please continue. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, I will go ahead and move to the next slide um, on our workforce technology investments and our EADBI, Early Intensive Developmental Behavioral Intervention um, changes. So um, about five and a half million in the next biennium investment for these two proposals and then um, about 3.3 in the out years. So our workforce technology in, um, investments is looking at the technology for home grant primarily um, and making an increase to that grant so that we can serve more people to get access to um, technology supports where they can stay in their own homes. Um, we'd also like to expand the purpose of the grant to also be used in community residential settings um, so that people can, um, we can alleviate some of the staffing and workforce pressures in those settings. And then lastly, this proposal increases the specialized equipment and supplies um, yearly limit from around $4,000 a year to $10,000 a year. So these um, recommendations came out of the technology task force that was passed by the legislature maybe in 2020, I can't remember the exact year, but these were um, uh, suggestions that, that are um, uh, come from the community and, and we agree with them and are um, looking forward to this investment. Um, the early intensive developmental behavioral intervention, um, uh, part of this proposal the governor carried uh, last year in his budget recommendations. So this is making a change to some of our rates under EIDBI, which is our autism service for um, people under uh, 21 who have autism or related conditions. Um, so making a change to the rate so that um, right now there are some um, culturally specific providers that can get a higher rate. Um, because they are fluent in another language. And when it comes to our native populations, many have lost their language, unfortunately, not um, uh, you know, because of the, the effects of colonization. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we are providing access to American Indians who wanna um, provide that service and provide that culturally responsive service that's really needed in that community. And so this proposal does that. And then lastly, EADBI is not a licensed service, it's um, clinicians, many clinicians are providing the service, so they themselves have licenses, but um, there is not an overall um, regulatory structure, and, and issues have come up in the past about that, and so we'd like to um, invest in a study to really pull together stakeholders and talk about all the diverse points of view and what makes sense in terms of um, regulation going forward. Um, so a couple of proposals on this slide related to our small customized living providers um, as well as our um, a benefit called life sharing. Um, so our, our first proposal on this slide is establishing a grant for our small customized living providers um, to help support them in covering costs as they transition to um, a different, potentially different kind of licensure, so a community residential setting um, licensure. And then the second part of this proposal is allowing for special payments, so a higher payment um, to customized living service providers that are going to be closing and get that, um, get that approval from the Department of Health to make sure that they can continue to serve people in their settings um, and, are, and people aren't um, displaced. And then our life sharing proposal this year um, establishes a formal life sharing um, medical assistance benefit. So life sharing is, um, 
not really a new model, but a newish model um, that's really similar to um, what we have right now for um, family residential services that used to be called family foster care. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a, a little bit different and that's a real, really relationship based um, and matching um, who people want to live with and who, you know, maybe perhaps you're a uh, provider at a group home and you have, you leave and you have a, a very, you know, strong relationship with someone you were working with and you actually want them to become a, a part of your family. Um, so this is a much more relationship-based service that involves um, matching um, and there's, I think, a limit of about two people in a home. Right now, our family residential services, um, which have, you know, been great for people, um, in some cases have turned into looking very similar to um, what our group homes look like, so kind of a corporate um, um, shift staff model where there's four people in the home and it, it looks like the same thing as a group home. It's just called something different. The person that, um, um, that owns that setting or owns that business lives there. That's kind of the only difference in some of these settings. And so we really want to promote this new life sharing service. We have um, a way that, that this works right now under current law and court current authorities, but we want to um, lift that up and codify um, the discrete benefit um, and also increase the rate so we can incentivize people um, to use this service. Um, and so in doing so, we would take a look at our family residential services and change some of the rates. This was a proposal similar to a governor's proposal from 2021 um, and tie those rates instead to a person's support needs. So this would be something that would be effective um, a few years out in 2026 um, because we do need to wait for some um, updates in our min choices system to make sure we have access to the best data that's um, that's tested and, and makes sense in terms of what those residential or what those um, support ranges are for people. Madam Chair. Senator Abler. Can you put a gold star by this one? Gold Thank you. star, yes. <laughs> gold star, on the, great. Continue. Um, all right, and so the next um, couple of proposals around improving assessment experience for people um, and lead agencies as well as planning for some of those um, innovative workforce solutions that um, Ms. Bailey talked about a few of those earlier in the presentation. So um, the first proposal, 8069, improving the assessment experience. Um, part of this funding um, in this proposal is for ongoing operational um, enhancements to our MinChoices platform. Um, we have a minimally viable product right now that just isn't set up to keep pace with all the changes in the future and make sure that um, it's improving and that, that the user experience is continually improving. So this uh, proposal provides ongoing funding to support that product. Um, this proposal also includes um, some changes to assessor qualifications for um, min choices or long-term care consultation. So um, we would lower these to someone with one year of home and community-based experience, um, but continue to have all of the other relevant education and experience training. Um, as part of those assessments, this was something that counties felt was going to be helpful in getting, um, getting their backlogs reduced of those assessments. And then lastly, we really, um, have really been intrigued and interested in the conversations around presumptive eligibility that have occurred um, over the past few years. Um, so we would like to fund um, a study to look at our medical assistance financial um, eligibility as well as functional eligibility, the kind of eligibility that's determined under our HCBS waivers and really understand if there's some way that we can um, streamline some processes and make sure that people get eligible as soon as possible, sooner than, than they do now, um, and get access to those important services. Madam Chair. Oh, Senator Abler. Um, thanks. Is this the same idea about the hospitals with their presumption of eligibility? Is this the same study you would do with people that are stuck there? You don't know how to get rid of them? I mean, how to get them on a funding stream so they can move on to somewhere? Is this the same idea? Ms. Grom. Madam Chair, Senator Abler, it's a similar idea. I mean, this is a study, so it's a very complicated um, effort to do this, but this is what we mentioned to you when, when we talked right. a little bit about that hospital issue of something that we think would really help. But this would include that? S Senator yes. Abler. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other, uh, you want two gold stars? Uh, that's kind of hard on you guys, but I'm happy to tell you where I am. I think you're on the right track. So thank you very much. Ms. Graham. Thank you. And so I think, do we have any more workforce, Elise, or is that the end of? Uh, Ms. Graham, I think you didn't do the second one. Oh, you're right. Um, all right, so AD56, Planning for Innovative and Community-Driven Workforce Solutions. This is another one that ties in with um, uh, people 
getting stuck at hospitals. So this mm -hmm. is administrative funding for um, a study to look at a few of our waiver services, our positive support services, our specialist services, um, and our respite services or crisis services, um, and, and get an understanding if we could move those services and how would we do that into a state plan authority to increase access. So right now, you have to be on a waiver to get those services. They, they tend to serve people with those complex behavioral health needs. Um, and so we've heard, this is something we've heard from counties and hospitals is that um, a lot of people aren't on a waiver and they might not, even if they're eligible, they might not want to get on a waiver. And so um, is there a way that we could expand access? And so this would be a study to do that. And then also included in this one is um, uh, a curriculum for, for county case managers to better support them in um, um, understanding how to support people in their own homes and having some tools around um, care coordination. When people are living in their own homes, it's a lot different to be a case manager when you have someone living in you know, a residential setting, for example, where a lot of the um, services and needs are already set up. Um, and so there's funding for, for that curriculum planning as part of this proposal as well. And then moving on, if there aren't questions, to our behavioral health segment. Um, so um, here on the slide, you can see that we serve um, over 300,000 people in our behavioral health programs um, through a variety of services, you know, beginning with kind of intervention services and um, talk therapy and um, acute services, and then rounding it out with those more um, recovery-based recovery, recovery -based services like peer supports, for example, or aftercare um, type services. Um, so as part of this presentation, I'm gonna cover both behavioral, um, mental health and substance use disorder services. I know that this committee is primarily focused on um, substance use disorder services, but for the committee's benefit, I thought we would share it all if time permits and if that's um, okay with, it, with Madam Chair. Yes. All right, so just jumping right into our proposals then. Um, the first one is related to reducing disparities for opioid use disorders, um, as well as making some changes around opioid treatment program rates. Um, and transforming our medical assistance SUD continuum. So some of these proposals might look familiar to members. There's some membership changes to the, um, the Opiate Epidemic Response Advisory Council in here to really make sure that we're diversifying that body given the um, escalating um, disparities that we're seeing in um, Native and Black populations in particular as they relate to opioid, the opioid epidemic. And so, um, we would be adding a member from each tribal nation as a part of this proposal to urban American Indian members. Um, and then also this year, something that's different is making sure that we have um, enough representation from the African American and black community on the, on the council as well, given the disparities there. Um, we would also be making some changes to, um, or adding some requirements in law around um, these grants that, that the ORAC gives out um, and how what percentage of them needs to go to communities um, of color that are most disproportionately impacted. And so um, right now I think the ORAC is doing you know, a really excellent job of, of um, trying to get the money into the communities that most need it. Um, and so this is really codifying the, the current practice and making sure that you know, with future iterations of, of that um, council that they continue to invest um, in BIPOC communities. So it would be a 50% requirement that 50% of the grants at minimum need to go to culturally specific projects. Um, we have some the changes around opioid treatment program rates. This is a program integrity issue that um, we d discussed last session as well, but it's creating, modifying our OTP rates, that these are the settings where people um, primarily get ac access to methadone, but also Suboxone and other services, um, and making sure that we're um, cleaning up some issues around you know, potential payments when people are getting take-home doses. Um, and so this would create a weekly drug bundle rate that would cover the, the drugs themselves and then would require that all of those sort of ancillary supportive services that might occur in those settings are um, billed separately. Um, and then it's also giving us some, um, an eye into um, getting more data on these settings and really trying to track better outcomes when, for example, when we do see that people are accessing um, you know, individual counseling or group counseling in these settings and, and getting the medication. Are we seeing improvements versus if someone's getting medication only? Um, we have funding in this proposal for what's called um, an ECHO for our opioid treatment program. So this sort of goes hand in hand with really trying to improve um, the transparency and the integrity and making sure that our OTP programs are person-centered. Um, so this would create a new ECHO. So it's um, sort of a... <coughs> 
some a provider learning community essentially um, for um, for OTPs to get together and talk about best practices and really learn from each other on what's working. Um, this proposal, um, BH57, also includes funding for um, just study setting up an 1115 medical assistance demonstration waiver um, to begin to provide behavioral health services and correctional facilities to the extent that we can. There are some federal limitations there, um, but some other states are looking at how to do this, and we'd like to join in um, that study and see if there's anything that we could stand up to get MA services in those settings. Um, where people are sort of getting a patchwork of services right now and we're seeing some pretty pretty extreme outcomes when people are being released in terms of overdose rates. We'd also like to look at um, adding a traditional healing medical assistance benefit, so that would be part of this study, um, as well as a contingency management benefit, which um, contingency man management is an evidence-based program that um, primarily impacts people with methamphetamine addictions. Um, and so we'd like to take a look to see if there's something we could do innovative um, around that space as well. And then lastly, um, we've got funding in here for capacity building and startup grants for our withdrawal management programs, which is really a need. We have nine programs across the state and we have you know, um, an opioid crisis right now and just not enough um, supports for people who need that, that withdrawal management, that kind of medically monitored setting. Um, but also remembering that these are settings where once people are safely um, withdrawing, they're also getting access to resources to you know, transition to treatment or you know, peer supports or things that would be helpful for them depending on where they're at in their recovery journey. Um, so our expediting access to behavioral health services has a, um, several proposals. Uh, most of them are in the, the substance use disorder jurisdiction, but we do have one um, mental health um, provision in this in this uh, package. So the first part of this proposal is making sure that hospitals, federally qualified health centers, and our rural health clinics um, are able to provide comprehensive assessments. These are the assessments that people get when they need to access substance use disorder services. So, um, Mr. Chair, you mentioned Rule 25s, I think, yesterday. Um, and so the, these are the new Rule 25s, the new and improved Rule 25s post the direct access reform. Um, and so right now, FQs and, and rural health clinics and hospitals, I believe can, um, there are some ways that they can do the comprehensive assessments, but the billing is, is quite prohibitive, um, and they would have to get a 245G license, which also is prohibited, and these are highly regulated um, settings. So we want to make sure that when people are in the community, they're at their primary care setting or in the hospital for that matter, um, you know, they're able to get, get access to those assessments right there at that time and get a referral. So, Ms. Grom? There's a, there's a need, especially on the children's side of that, on the children's mental health. MBA. I'm just going to put under one umbrella because they're co-occurring. They should be under, I don't know why they're in somebody else's jurisdiction. They should be all in mine. But that's just a sidebar that's supposed to be funny, but it's not. But are you looking at um, maybe finding some flexibility? When you're talking about youth, high school, middle school, even elementary school, when you have... Social workers, you have somebody in the school district, right? And, and if if somebody has a, you know, to be able to get access to billable services, they have to go through this assessment process, right? Are you looking at possibly having some flexibility in saying if there's a need, there's a need, there's a need, kind of like under, if a, if a child exhibits one of the 13 categories that fit for alignment under IDEA, it's a simple unique and individualized needs, right? And you look at that and you say a compre fully comprehensive educational evaluation including academic, psychological, and functional behavioral assessment to determine eligibility. It's comprehensive as heck. That's federal law, Blair, if you want to know that. But that's a comprehensive thing. But there are some programs within that, you know, they can do some intervening services where it doesn't take that full assessment. Is, is there any conversation about that on, instead of a comprehensive assessment for the youth, the younger ones in grade school? Because... There are eight-year-olds that are opioid addiction in, in the state of Minnesota. I mean, it's sad, right? So does that come across your table at all? Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for the question. I think it's a good one. You know, I haven't heard that specific conversation oh. about, um, you know, finding more flexibilities for school systems to be able to do their um, comprehensive assessments, but I, we definitely have heard about um, the increase in issues in schools and, um, you know, the need, for example, to have... Um, life-saving medications if there is an overdose in a school setting of you know some very young children experiencing um, substance use disorders so I think we 
very much like to engage in ongoing conversations on that. So to that point then, Ms. Grom, and, and thank you for letting me leave and come back. We did pass the energy bill, by the way. So um, the, the conversation is, would it be the districts, would the, the Department of Human Services oversee that flexibility in assessing whether a child's unique needs for behavioral health and including recovery community on the preventive side, the addiction side, and, and the follow-up recovery side of it? Or is that the Department of Ed that's going to have to make those kinds of callings? Or is that just something you want to cogitorum on and come back? Because it was just a question to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, I'm not certain. I think definitely we would be involved in the conversation, but it would be a collaborative one. I mean, we do have our school school based um, services that are provided, um, and those do in include substance use disorder services. I'm just not quite clear where comprehensive assessments fit in okay. to those services, but um, it's maybe a really a great question. Up. Yeah, yeah, maybe as a follow, we can see where that is because it's almost like there's that. You, do you have an LH LADC person to go ahead and do that? Or I mean, there's still some some gray matters in there, and I'd, I'd appreciate a follow-up on that. So keep going, Ms. Crown, I'm sorry. And members, I'm sorry, it's 4.35. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying this conversation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And maybe I'll make one final comment, not to belabor it, but um, some of the work that we're doing with um, very integrated work with our mental health um, providers and our you know um, CCBHC providers is looking at um, and this will come up later in some of our proposals, is looking at comprehensive assessments and trying to align them more with diagnostic assessments. So right now, we have requirements in our Mental Health Uniform Service Standards chapter of law around diagnostic assessments, and I think um, some of the streamlining that we can do is moving our comp assessment requirements over there too and making it easier where there's um, um, practitioners that are maybe doing both of those assessments to, to make those... Um, to make it just easier for them to provide the assessment and to access those um, those services for, you know, kids and adults. That would make sense. Thank you. Um, all right. And then another part of this proposal is related to an administrative allowance right now that counties and tribes get um, to provide um, administrative services around substance use disorder services. Um, this is an allowance that um, predates direct access, and so. It was really supporting counties as they were what was called a placing authority um, and getting people access to treatment. Now that they don't play that role, um, they still play an important role. People still go to the counties. Um, and what we've heard from counties and, and tribes is that, um, in particular, a lot of people that are justice involved do need a lot of supports of the county. And so there's an ongoing need for this kind of administrative um, allocation, but we need to take a look at the, the methodology and make sure that it makes sense. So this is a study to hire some experts to help us with that. Um, we've got a public awareness campaign in this proposal, really making sure that people understand how to get access to treatment. We have our direct access reform that happened, um, and it's new for people. People don't realize you don't go and get a Rule 25, and so we need to make sure people know um, how to access our, our programs. Um, we have funding for um, a couple of our, um, our um, homelessness-related grants, so PATH and Hasasmi. Um, right now, those programs are open to people with um, mental health issues um, or co-occurring, but not people with a standalone SUD diagnosis. Um, so we would increase funding for these grants to better support people who are either experiencing homelessness or potentially could experience homelessness due to some of their um, behavioral health issues. And then... Hold up on that. I just am shaking my head because I'm going, it's just, it's a, that one's like a hello, duh. I mean, what's the hold up for that, Ms. Grom? Well, Mr. Chair, this was in our proposal last year, um, and so it didn't pass because the budget didn't pass, but we would, we appreciate your support there. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good, Ms. Grau. That was the, I don't answer the question I don't know the answer to, and you just like, there you go. I like that, so keep going. You're good. Well, You're really good. You know, good to be partners with you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. All right, and then lastly, um, we have uh, something called adult mental health initiatives. These are regional collaboratives across the state um, to help support um, local areas provide mental health services and get additional funding to do that. Um, and we have one tribal AMHI or adult mental health initiative. It's White, White Earth Nation. We would love to have more, um, but what we've heard in consultation with them is that they, they need some additional funding to really build capacity um, to better serve their members. So we've got a direct allocation 
um, for them in this proposal really honoring that request. Uh, the next proposal that I'll, I'll touch on here is improving the quality of service and alleviating administrative burdens on uh, substance use disorder providers. And this, um, you know, doesn't look like a huge amount of money, um, 2.2 million in, in the next biennium and then 2.4 in the out years. But I will say this has the potential to have a really profound impact on people who are accessing our substance use disorder services. So this is... Um, taking a step back and really looking at how do we transform our system into one that's evidence-based, person-centered, culturally um, relevant for people. Um, and in doing that, we're um, looking at ensuring that all of the American Society for Addiction Medicine criteria are codified in law um, so that um, uh, people accessing treatment services all have access to those evidence-based standards. Um, right now, um, residential providers are required to comply with ASAM standards by January 1st of 2024. And so this proposal would require that all providers or outpatient providers then would come on board with meeting those standards by January 1st, 2025, and then would, of course, gain access to that um, enhanced rate that, that providers get under our current demonstration program. Um, in addition to implementing these ASAM standards, and I should say that the ASAM standards, this is something that will greatly improve the quality um, and outcomes of our treatment um, our treatment settings, it's also a federal compliance issue where we've made an agreement with CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, to, um, to implement statewide ASAM criteria. Um, related to this, as part of this bill, a lot of what's in um, this proposal is similar to um, the items that you talked about earlier this week with the Provider Association um, March. Um, and we've been working with them over the interim to really look at some of the ideas they brought forward last year. As you probably recall, um, they weren't quite ready to go, but they were really important ideas. And so we've had some um, great conversations with them over the interim and have really incorporated um, what we've come up with collectively into this bill. And so we've got changes around the individual treatment plan frequency, for example, um, looking at requirements in residential settings around um, hourly weekly hourly requirements that are somewhat arbitrary um, and really making some changes that, that align with um, the, the person-centered ASAM standards um, to address some of those issues. We've also got funding for a utilization management program um, across all of our SUD system to make sure that um, we're supporting our provider community um, and, and kind of tracking to make sure that people are getting um, just the right amount of care, um, not too much, not too little. Um, and then importantly, I think we talked about this earlier today, we have funding for a data analysis and evaluation team for the um, behavioral health area. That's something that providers you've heard talking about and we, we tend to agree we do a good job of um, collecting some of our opioid data and we, we also have data um, that's required under our 1115, um, but we would like to be doing more of that and making that data available to the public and, and policymakers as you make your important decisions on on uh, treatment services. Um, okay, so improving access to behavioral health services. This proposal includes um, some funding for um, room and board for children's in children's residential facilities. So in 2021, advocates came forward with some ideas around um, uh, related to the implementation of Families First. Um, and um, wanting to make sure that people who are accessing children's residential facilities don't have to go into child protection to get access to that medical service. And so there was what was called a third path made. So previously you had to either enter or get access to those, those MA services through um, voluntary or involuntary child protection, and now the third path is just direct access to those services. The issue that counties and tribes are facing is that when people enter those services, um, through the non-child protection pathway, they don't get access to some of the federal um, federal funds that you would get when people are on child protection. And so this proposal provides funding for room and board for counties and tribes using the behavioral health fund to cover some of those room and board costs. Um, this proposal also similar to last year includes an increase to our adult day treatment rates. Um, so a 50% increase over the current rates. Um, we would also like to look at some ongoing funding for an online tool or platform to help support families, people find the right kinds of behavioral health supports that they need. Um, right now we do have a tool that does this and it's, it's um, sort of funded through a patchwork of funding streams and so we'd like to um, make sure that that's an ongoing funding stream and we'd also like to enhance some of the 
um, aspects of that tool if we can. So for example, if you're a person that's seeking you know, LGBTQ specific services that you can go online and you can find are there open beds or are there open you know, programs at a, at a therapist who um, specializes in that area. Um, also in this proposal is additional funding for our school linked behavioral health grants. I mentioned those a little bit earlier. So this is funding for um, all of our school district, all of, all of those grant programs as well as our intermediate school district um, pro, um, behavioral health programs or grants. Um, and then lastly, there's funding for the transition to community initiative um, in this proposal. So it's additional ongoing funding. We got some temporary funding in 2021 that we would like to continue. Um, and we'd also like to expand eligibility of this program to children. This is another hospital decompression strategy. Um, this is a very effective grant program um, that's been over the years really um, supporting people leaving um, you know, Anoka um, treatment facility, for example. I think in 20, 2021, we expanded it to people leaving hospitals. Um, and thinking about kids that are sort of stuck in those ERs right now, we just think that um, expanding that eligibility to children will, will have a, a really important impact on that population. Uh, our mental health crisis and early intervention services. So this is a series of primarily early intervention um, strategies that we're bringing forward this session around 20, 25 million in the next biennium and 30 million in the out years. So similar to last year's governor's budget, we've got some funding for first episode psychosis in our emerging mood disorders program. Um, the additional funding for our FEP program um, I think would be would, could potentially start another two settings. We also have we have about three current FEP programs throughout the state, um, and it's my understanding that they do have some significant waiting lists. So we want to make sure that people have access to this evidence-based early intervention that can really improve outcomes for people um, experiencing you know psychosis and schizoid disorders. Age range of, when you say early intervention services and early intervening what's what's the age range you got there well mr. chair for the entire package it really begins at the infant level um, our FEP I, I'll have to go back and look at the eligibility there but um, but typically psychosis tends to show up in early adolescence um, and so, so I it's think birth early, well, I wanted to get yeah. to. So my question then to the commissioner is, since you're looking at a new early childhood, <laughs> is this gonna naturally fit into that realm of, of the early childhood scopes? Because these are intervention services. These are early childhood mental health consultation programs. These are, uh, Mr. I'm Chair. trying to get to the essence of 1986 when they created this thing that said comprehensive coordinated and collaborative early intervention services to states and Minnesota is now gonna going to embrace that concept mm -hmm. um, and so when I saw that I'm like hmm, hmm here's a prime example of is that the kinds of conversations that should could be happening to say yeah because otherwise, if we're not having those conversations, then we're just going to have that siloed approach to that. And I guess it's a question to you: Did that is is that something you would be looking at? And I don't have to answer that, but it's just I just had an aha moment, Commissioner. No, that's, that's all. good. I, are you question? Are you wondering about the new Children's Agency? For yeah, example? as you're looking yeah. at that, this is the kinds of yeah. stuff. If you're looking at truly Franz model integrated McKnight model stuff, that's going right. to really make a difference structurally, right? right? The Linda Cook Pletchers of the world. I'll give right. you more names you can go talk to, but yeah. that's the stuff that it's like. Right. There should be that integration and conversation on that. Yep. That's so, so. At this point, the thought process is that children's mental health would remain at DHS. And so we would need to work very closely with the other agency on these issues. Yeah, as you're looking at it, if it's early intervention services, if you're defining that, that would be one of those components to, to look at. So yep. that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you, Ms. Grom. No problem, Mr. Chair. Um, also in this proposal is a pilot to look at a, a model that's um, being used in other states and at, at least one county that, that I know of in the state here. Um, it's called the Mobile Response and Stabilization <laughs> Services Model. Um, and so this is just a different way to do crisis response for, um, for families and youth and making sure that when there is a crisis that, that the, um, the team is meeting that person in that moment, connecting them to the services that they need, but then that they're actually staying with that family and that person on an ongoing basis for at least six months following that event to build resiliency, to build awareness of around 
how, how do you know? Are there signs that you can tell when a, when a crisis might happen in the future to really um, make sure that that families and and children are able to address those crises in a way that reduces um, referrals to our child protection system or, or um, having to go to residential levels of care. Are you tracking the engagement on that through like any software programs or apps? Are you able to track engagement in this program that you're talking about? Um, Mr. Chair, I'm not certain. I know part of this proposal is working with Technical Assistance Center from somewhere out east. I can't remember the state, of course, now. Um, That's okay. But, but, yeah, there's a lot of support that goes uh, into this pilot. I think what we want to do is um, um, tr definitely track the outcomes in some way. I don't know if it's through an app. Um, so that we can understand, is this a model that we somehow need to implement into our medical assistance program? So, so last year, I think, or two years ago, when you had a department had the guy from Olmstead County, um, I forget his name, but he was just very smart and articulate and, and, and helped uh, talk about just engagement, lack of engagement. Senator Abler had put together, there's a, a pilot project that's going on in Anoka County. Go figure, Anoka County, right? Um, and they're using um, a Pathfinder app that, that tracks engagement. They're finding is, you know, um, engagement is the opposite. You know, being involved is the opposite of addiction. You're seeing some really good things on that. It's, I guess I just wanted to know, are, is that something they're utilizing as that engagement tool? And it, the answer, is, I guess, is no. But I know the White Earth Monoman, the White Earth tribe is absolutely... Um, full in on that, you know, they're doing that and they're starting to, to track that stuff throughout their system too. So, I mean, there's some innovation that's going on around that field. So, yeah. go ahead. Absolutely, Mr. Oh, Chair. Mr. Senator, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was wondering, is this proposal similar to the Navigate program? And I don't know if you're familiar with the Navigate program. It's um, run in partnership um, with the University of Minnesota. Um, out of St. Louis Park. Hmm. I never heard of that. Met Miss, it, Miss, Miss Grom, you ever heard of that? Mr. Chair, Senator Rasmussen, I have not heard of that program. I'm sorry, I, I should look into it and I can get back to you. Thank Senator you. Rasmussen, maybe, yeah, that right. would be good to... And the thing yeah. I would add is, you know, this, I think, Navigate, um, it has a good track record for the early interventions, especially around psychosis. Um, and I had a, a constituent tell me a heartbreaking story about how they live in Fergus Falls and, and knew that this program would be great for their child, but because of physical distance and they weren't able to receive the coordinated care. And so I'd especially be interested in how this uh, would be implemented in communities in greater Minnesota to make sure that um, they have the same access to these services. Wow, Ms. Grom, that's, that's uh, <clears throat> that somebody from Fergus Falls hears about something in, where did you say, Hopkins? St. Louis Park, Hopkins, St. Louis Park. They're close to one another. Yep. Ms. Grom. Mr. Chair, Senator, we, um, we'd be glad to talk more about that. I think we have one FEP program right now that's in um, Duluth. But um, expanding um, to greater Minnesota is certainly um, something that we've been thinking about. We can talk some more about that. Um, and then just a couple of final items on this. Um, in this proposal, there's additional grant funding for our mobile crisis teams. Um, we received temporary funding from the 2021 legislature and want to make sure that we can continue that funding um, to support those teams. There's teams across, across the state. These are primarily run by counties um, and really help meet people where they're at when they're experiencing a crisis and connect them to the right services. Um, and there, there is medical assistance funding for these programs, but there are certain aspects of them given that they're required to be operating 24 24 hours a day, seven days a week, where there are just some um, some expenses that are not MA reimbursable. And when someone is calling up in crisis, um, while we do require teams to, to ask for insurance, it's not really the first thing you're thinking if you're in crisis of where your, your insurance card is. I don't I don't know where mine is at the moment, and I'm not in crisis. So um, we would need some additional funding for those teams um, and, and sending some of that funding directly to our tribes who operate their own mobile crisis teams. That's something they've asked. Um, that we consider in the governor's budget, and so we've included that here. And then lastly, expanding our infant and early childhood mental health consultation program. So this is a program that supports um, adults, so um, teachers and paraprofessionals and maybe administrators who are supporting students who have um, some um, emotional challenges or mental health issues, um, and really understanding um, how to best support students and create better outcomes for them. 
Um, and so right now this is available in our daycare settings, but we would like to expand this to schools to amplify the impact there. And see, there's one, Ms. Crown, and I know we're barking up at 5 o'clock, and, and, and this has been, for me, I'm grateful for you three and actually, yeah, you know, to, to go through this and have this mm -hmm. conversation just because we're looking at what is it, what are we going to do? You know, what's it look like? So um, I'll, I'll let you, I won't interject with what a, a statement I was going to make, but I'll just let you keep going because you got a couple more slides to go, right? Okay, yep. Well, I can breeze through this next slide, Mr. Chair, pretty quickly. Uh, most of these were, were in our proposal in some way, shape, or form last year, so we're looking to increase funding. And was that passed, that proposal that passed in the Senate? Is that is that right? Is that the one that passed on the Senate floor? House file 2725. Oh, God, no. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was a mental health um, mini <laughs> omnibus that passed last session, which we are grateful for. Um, including um, authorizing the provider supervision grants. And so those were authorized. We'd like to see some additional funding. Um, those cover um, particularly um, providers in greater Minnesota to make sure that we're getting them funding to be able to support all of the workforce needs they have um, and covering their supervision costs, which is a barrier to people becoming um, mental health professionals and, and LADCs. Um, similar with the, our cultural and ethnic minority infrastructure grant. And then lastly, I do want to highlight the... Um, the startup funding um, and workforce funding for psychiatric residential treatment facilities. This was in the in the budget last year, but one of the things we're adding to this is um, additional funding to incentivize providers and, and provide the kinds of resources that they need to take on um, children who have complex needs. They might have things like neurocognitive disorders or um, IDD coupled with other behavioral health issues, or um, these are some of the children that are being labeled as aggressive. Um, and uh, we really need to make sure that we're able to help support those transitions from hospitals and, um, and get them into settings that can really help, help treat them and get them back to the community. And so we've got that um, initiative in this, in this proposal as well. Sober homes um, uh, have been working with stakeholders. <laughs> um, sorry, just looking at you, Senator Hoffman. Um, have been working with stakeholders over the interim on sober homes and um, what we need to do to regulate those settings. So these aren't... Um, SUDMA services that are provided, but there are, they are serving people who are in recovery, are in you know, a precarious place oftentimes in their recovery where they need supports um, and they need housing to, to stay well and to continue their recovery. And so um, what we've decided to do in our proposal, and I think this aligns with what stakeholders are working on, is really um, codifying some basic protections for people in law, things around having to have access to their medication. So if they're on methadone or suboxone, they need access to their medications or any other mental health medications for that matter. Um, making sure that there's requirements around um, keeping access to their belongings and not having them thrown out if they leave the place and access to integrated um, services um, and referrals. So, um, and the, the kind of main part of this is creating a certification program, a voluntary certification program for, for providers that don't take um, any form of public funding and uh, required one if you're taking any kind of public funding and that would be effective out in 2026 while we really continue to survey the landscape and understand how to stand up that certification in a meaningful way. And then I think I just have one more slide that I can hopefully um, end on a good note here. Oh. That was a great note. You, I, okay. I was smiling, and Senator Rasmussen, we were waiting for you to get to that because Senator Rasmussen had a follow-up question, and I was going to wait for you to finish this next slide and just say Senator Rasmussen, and there you go. But so, unless you want to have the conversation now with him, Mr. Chair, your whatever your preference is, Senator Rasmussen, you want to wait? Yeah. All right, go ahead, Christy. You want to, or Miss Miss Grom? Sorry, Miss Grom, you want to get us out? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so um, I think this is our last slide. So there, we have a pretty robust package around behavioral health peer support. So we've got um, MA peer supports on both the mental health and SUD side. Um, and this proposal is really looking at some of the recommendations from MMB and their results first team around how to improve, in particular, recovery peer supports. Um, so we're hoping to um, sort of standardize some of the requirements around these um, MA services so that they're the same um, kind of worker eligibility criteria, um, uh, testing requirements, and curriculum requirements so that um, we're thinking about integration across these two types of services as well as addressing some of the workforce shortages and, and attracting these kinds of workers. Um, in addition, <coughs> this proposal will um, 
um, require that for, for RCOs, recovery community organizations who want to become eligible MA vendors of peer recovery services, that they need to meet an accreditation either through um, the, the ARCO, Association for Community uh, Recovery Community, Association for Recovery Community Organizations, um, the Council on Accreditation of Peer Recovery Support, also called CAPRIS, or a, state, a statewide um, recovery community organization. Um, and as long as they meet uh, um, um, accreditation through one of those three bodies, then um, and they meet the best practices that we would codify in law, then they would be able to provide those MA peer supports. Um, also part of this proposal is expanding MA vendor eligibility for, um, for counties and adding some um, grants for recovery community organizations to, um, well, I'm sorry, extending some of the grants for recovery community organizations to cover those services that are not MA eligible. Um, and then lastly, some startup grant funding for um, making sure that we've got more culturally specific recovery community organizations. Thank you, Ms. Grom. You three are amazing. I appreciate you, Commissioner. I appreciate you, Ms. Bailey. I appreciate you, Ms. Grom. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and just, um, you know, Commissioner, while uh, we may not all agree with the proposals in your budget, I do want to recognize and thank your team uh, for all of the obvious hard work that they've put into putting this proposal together um, for us to digest. One specific question I had is regarding uh, capacity for civil commitment at St. Peter mm -hmm. and was wondering if anything in the budget proposal today um, would allow for an increase in capacity um, at St. Peter. Just a, a couple you know, thoughts and concerns. I had one of the counties that I represent have an individual who is um, MIND status, and they're looking at potentially, uh, before this person could be admitted to St. Peter, uh, spending upwards of $600,000 uh, paying for this individual to be at a different facility, um, even though he'd be qualified to be at St. Peter. And so I just have concerns around that and wondered uh, how your budget responds to that need. Wow. Commissioner. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair and Senator Rasmussen, uh, we don't have a proposal in here to expand capacity at St. Peter. Uh, as I've mentioned, we're talking with a group of community providers in healthcare and um, nursing homes, group homes, uh, direct care and treatment folks are involved in that conversation about the best solutions to the questions of people not having a spot to go that meets their specific current needs. Um, we would hate to see a solution to that be institutionalizing more people than we need to in, in Minnesota. Um, and so we're looking at as many options as we can around that, but uh, certainly in the middle of that conversation and expecting some solutions to come out of that and put some language together, and you'll see that this session. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. And I would just encourage uh, your department and this committee to uh, consider what we can do to increase the capacity at St. Peter. I think this is um, beyond a, a care concern. It's also and a uh, financial concern for the counties. It's also a public safety concern when we have individuals who have been deemed mentally ill and dangerous uh, to their community and making sure that we have an appropriate care setting um, for them to both see, you know, get the, the treatment and care they need while also ensuring uh, the public safety of our community and state is met. And so I look forward to working with uh, Chair Hoffman and um, Commissioner Harpstead on this issue. Thank you, Senator Rasmussen. Senator May Quaid, were you? No. Nope. Senator Abler, any? He's gone. <laughs> Lots. We're going to talk 48 hours. We're going to talk, right? We're going to do all that coming up and, and add that to that. That's part of that whole conversation, the capacity piece. And so thank you for bringing that up. And you're going to talk equalization of nursing homes, right? I'm kidding. <laughs> Next time. Thank you. Thank you, three. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for taking take it and walk in talk, talking us through this, and I appreciate it. So th you. with that, we're adjourned. Yeah.